So here's a second example of a common uh, way in which Mendelian patterns fail. This is the ABO blood group in human beings and in mammals in general. And as you probably know, your blood type can be A, B, A, B, or O. And now some of you also will be thinking, well, wait a minute, I made positive or A negative. Those are actually two different systems. The first system is ABO, which just, just determines these four phenotypes. The plus and minus is a system that is determined by an RH factor, and that actually does follow Mendel's principle where plus is dominant. But this is different. This one is not going to follow Mendel's principle. So here's the thing. Let's first look at the physiology of this. What makes an individual type A? Type A individuals have that because on their blood cells, on their red blood cells, are proteins of a particular shape that are produced by a particular gene. And those proteins have a shape that the immune system can recognize. Now, the gene can also produce other shaped proteins of the same sort. It's the same protein with a slight variation. And that slight variation is recognizable also to the immune system. And we call that, that different variant B. Okay, so some people who are type A, for example, I'm type A, I have a particular shape of the proteins on my red blood cells represented in this picture as triangles. Other people who are type B, the same protein has a slightly different shape represented here as circles. Okay, so if somebody is type AB, that's because they express both the triangles and the circles. They, expre they express both of these proteins. Somebody who's type O expresses neither of these proteins. Okay, so this then is the uh, phenotypic pattern that we see. And this is the key thing I want to point out. These are phenotypes. A, B, A, B, and O are phenotypes. They are not genotypes. Therefore, we will not use these letters to represent the gene because that becomes confusing. There are many, many many sources on the internet that make that mistake, that confuse genotype and phenotype here. So I'm going to insist that you use the proper notation here. All right? So let's take a look at this. What happens if you have matings with these different blood types? Okay, well, given what we know and given what you know from what we've just learned already, which is the knowledge that you came in with, can you predict what's going to happen in every single case? Here are the possible cases. A cross A, A cross B, B cross B, A cross AB, B cross AB. A, B, cross A, B, A, O, B, O, A, B, O, and O, O. Right? Those are all the possible things that can happen. Okay, what would you expect to see? Well, again, you could ask, okay, which one of these is dominant, which one's recessive, and so forth, and you might have heard other things, but let's do the predictions. Let's take a look and see what happens. Go ahead and take a moment to do that. Just take a few seconds to write out every single thing you think could be happening here before we move on. Before we take a look at your predictions and compare them to what we actually observe, let's take a look and see what's going on here. Now, the individuals who make type A proteins on their red blood cells have a particular gene that's producing A. and They have to have either one or two of those genes. Now, this particular trait also obeys Mendel's principle almost. It does have the same property that there are two of these genes per trait determining these phenotypes and one comes from each parent. But this particular gene that produces this protein has a name. It's called I. And so from now on, whenever we're talking about the genotypes, we're going to use this kind of notation, I. So one of the alleles here is big I with an A superscript. And that's because the gene is I, and it produces the A-shaped protein. So that allele is big I A. There's another allele, big I B, and big I B is, of course, the same protein, but it's made in that slightly different shape that we call B. There's also kind of a broken version of that gene, and it's a third allele that we re uh, replace with the little i. And some places have a big I O, but I prefer not to use that notation. This little i represents the uh, gene that does not produce any proteins whatsoever. Okay, so if you're type A, then you have, again, two I genes, and both of which can be carrying A, which makes you A, or one of them could be A and the other one makes nothing at all, in which case then all you express is A. Both of these individuals have phenotype A. Same thing for B. People who are type B can have genotype big IB, big IB, or big IB, little i. Individuals who are AB can only have one genotype, and that's one of the genes produces A and the other one produces B, so the big I, A, big I, B. And the only way you can be O is if you have the two broken versions, little i, little i. Okay, so that's what's happening. So we see here that this is Mendelian, except there's a third allele instead of just having two alleles. And that could explain all the variation that we see, but there's one other nuance. 
that's very important here. All right, let's move on and take a look and see what we actually observe in all of those matings. Now, two individuals who are type A can produce individual babies who are either A or O. Individuals who are A and B, so an A parent and a B parent, can produce offspring who are A, AB, and O, and B. Sorry, there's a mistake there. There should also be a B there. This situation, B cross B can produce B or O. In this situation here, A cross AB can produce either A, B, or AB, but not O in this case. What about B cross AB? Same thing, AB or AB. AB cross AB, also AB or AB. Notice, nowhere can AB produce an O here yet. Well, what about this? A cross O, well, again, you get A or O. B cross O, you get B or O. Here's a key, the last AB mating. AB cross O, you can either get A or B, and that's it. Now, there's the key. If you can see what's going on here, you can see exactly what's happening. And then O cross O only gives O. Okay, so what explains all of these patterns? What explains all of this? Well, there's really two things going on. First of all, again, there's more than two alleles. As we said, there's three different alleles going on here. And the other thing is this concept of, of codominance. Okay, now, look at this individual here, this heterozygote, okay? And look at these heterozygotes, the big I A, little I, big I B, little I. Now, look at this one, and let's apply the definition of, of dominance. Is the big I A dominant to little I? Well, the definition is, in heterozygote, if it's expressed fully, then it is dominant. So we see big I A is dominant over little I, because this is expressing A, not O. Okay, so big I A is dominant to little I. What about B? Same exact logic. B is dominant to little I. This is the fun one. What about this? Big I A and big I B. Which one is dominant? Well, again, which one is expressed in the heterozygote? An individual whose AB has A proteins. Therefore, the A phenotype is expressed in the heterozygote. Therefore, A is dominant. But notice B is too. B is also expressed in the heterozygote. Therefore, B is dominant. You see? So now, this is what we call codominance. Both of the alleles are equally expressed and fully expressed in the heterozygote. Therefore, they're both dominant. So A, big I A, and big I B is neither recessive to each other. And little i is recessive to both. So that's what's happening here. We have this situation of codominance. Okay? So in this case, the big I A, big I B are both type A and type B. They're not a blending of the two. They're not something in between A and B. I don't even know what that would be. A-ish, B-ish, I don't know. But they're both A and B. Okay, now, we've seen now two different violations of Mendel's principle. This one, codominance, and this one, this incomplete dominance. How do you keep them apart? Here's the point. If they blend, then we're looking at incomplete dominance. If they're both there, then we're looking at codominance. Okay? So consider this possibility. You take a red bull and mate it with a white cow, and the offspring is roan, which is a mixture of red and white. There are white patches and red patches on this animal's body. Is that incomplete dominance or codominance? Well, it is in this case codominance, because both the white and red are expressed. There's white patches and red patches, so that would be codominance. If it were incomplete dominance, then what you would see is the animal would be a mixture of red and white, which would be pink. It would be a pink cow, right? So it's not, because the cow is not pink. The cow is a mixture of red and white. All right, so which of these is the most common? Codominance or incomplete dominance or Mendelian dominance? Well, I've said this over and over again. You should recognize now Mendelian dominance is not going to be the most common. Incomplete dominance is a lot more common than Mendelian dominance. But codominance is even more common than incomplete dominance. So of the three, codominance is the most common. Incomplete dominance is next. And Mendelian dominance is the most rare. All right, to polish this one off, let's take a look at some examples because you're going to be needing to solve some of these problems on the exam and on the uh, Mendelian Genetics Laboratory. So let's take a look at this. Suppose we have two A individuals who are heterozygous. So they're big, a, uh, uh, big I, A, little I, and big I, A, little I. 
what do we see in the offspring? Okay, now, reasoning as we did before, and you could use a Punnett square if you wish, but think of it this way. This individual can give a big eye A half the time and a little eye half the time. Same thing for this. So what are the different ways that they can be combined? Well, remember it's FOIL. So it can be firsts, so that would be big IA, big IA, so that happens here. It could be outers, so big IA, little i, or it could be inners, i, big IA, which are, is the same as the previous one. So there are two different ways we can get big IA, little i, so that's half of them. Or they could be the lasts, little i, little i, which would give us a quarter of type O. Okay, so again, that's a way you can just look at it and just solve it without doing the Punnett square out. What about this one? Well, this one, same sort of thing. We can do the exact same thing. In fact, we can always do this. The big I A, big I B is the firsts. That happens a quarter of the time. Big I A, little i, that's going to be type A, happens a quarter of the time. Little i, big I B, which of course we write as big I B, little i, type B would happen a quarter of the time. And little i, little i happens a quarter of the time, so that'd be type O. What about this? This one's easy. If we have this individual who's type A, but they're homozygous, they can only give a big I A. And this individual half the time will give a big I B, and half the time will give a little I. So half the time we get A B, and half the time we get A little I, which is O, or sorry, type A. Okay, so we can go through all of these, and I would like you to do that, practice with it a little bit. But to help you, I'm going to sort of kick things off by setting out some more discussion questions. Okay, here are a few questions. First of all, can an AB individual ever have an O child? Okay, explain. They can explain how. If they can't, explain why not. All right now, consider this. Lupita has blood type A, but her brother Luca has blood type O, and so does her mother. What does that tell us, if anything, about her father? What genotype could he be, or do we know what his genotype must be? And if he has more than one possibility, what are those possibilities? List them all. All right. Third question, using a proper cross, using the crosses with the alleles, with the eyes, explain or show why parents who are type A, B, and O should not expect to have a child with either blood type A, B, or O. Okay, so those are three questions, which I will again post on to the discussion. And uh, those of you who are listening in on the video, can answer those questions, and again, I'll give you, if you give me a complete answer with all the details in the next 24 hours, I will give you five extra credit points on the, on the first exam. Now, one thing I should explain before we move on, and that is this. What everything I'm talking about here is dealing with genetics, not necessarily phenotypes. There's another concept that we haven't talked much about, it's called penetrance. And sometimes an individual can be genetically one thing, but they're phenotypically something else. Here's an example. It is possible for an individual who is AB to have a child who is phenotypically O. It's not possible for them to have a child who's genotypically O without a mutation, but it is possible for them to have a phenotypically O child. Okay, now. The reason for that is that sometimes these alleles don't quite penetrate through the phenotype. If they're there for whatever reason, the cells are just not building that protein, even though they do have the gene for it. So this has happened a few times in the times that I've taught this class that students have come up to me and said, but wait a minute, I'm type O and my dad is type AB or my mom is type AB. So just take a moment. If you happen to find yourself in a situation like that, don't go running to your parents and accusing anybody of anything untoward. It's possible that you are genotypically one thing and phenotypically something different. That's not uncommon.